Thanks very much. Um, yeah, when I was asked to give this talk, I you know, immediately started thinking about all the incredible developments in seismology over the past few decades and, and the rapidly advancing use of seismology in, uh, in new regimes. And so I came up with a sort of wide-ranging talk here. Tries to cover some of this, and, and my uh, predecessor speakers have done a great job of, of breaking ground in many of these areas. So, I mean, the point here, of course, is that, you know, it's not just solid Earth anymore. The oceans, atmosphere, tectosphere, cryosphere, biosphere, and even our civil environment are awash with elastic and gravity waves, and all the techniques that we've developed in seismology for the analysis of vibrational phenomena propagate into all these other regimes. Um, so uh, the continuous data, certainly, that IRIS has been recording has been, been seminal within this community. I think is in increasingly being appreciated way outside this community for its capability of uh, applying the methodologies that we're interested in to a wide range of scales and applications and, and various regimes. So, um, and this, uh, you know, as Victor was alluding, has a tremendous scale range. So at the top here, is the time-varying elastic and inelastic response of a 19-story building in France. Um, and uh, this is done by placing accelerometers inside the building, doing ambient noise correlation. On the top here, you can see variations in the uh, period and damping of the building as it responds to solar forcing and occupation by people and, and so forth at a tremendous uh, uh, level of resolution. And then at the bottom here, on a larger scale, you've got the time-varying elastic and anelastic response of a volcano from some of Florence's uh, seminal work. Um, and in this case, uh, the dilatation that's detectable in terms of the velocity variations even uh, uh, reflects the um, dilatation of the edifice due to the ascent of magma. Those green swaths there are, uh, are eruptions, and there's a, a precursory reduction in velocity before the eruptions at Piton de la Fernese. Um, we've also seen a tremendous variety of new uh, stick-slip uh, phenomena. Just one example here is the tightly modulated uh, slow slip uh, at the Willens Ice Stream. That's one of the uh, seminal papers uh, published back in the uh, mid-2000s by uh, Olga uh, Serjanko and Doug Weens at all's paper here. Um, and uh, the recognition that these were uh, unstable systems that could be influenced by very small perturbations um, in the tidal regime, I think, was, uh, was illuminating and highly unexpected. And then moving back to the correlation regime, here are some correlograms from a recent paper by Julian Chapu et al. that show that uh, you can actually use thermally forced ice quakes. So this is atmospheric forcing in a very brittle ice regime on a high Antarctic volcano. Um, and if you go back far enough in the coda, that's what those successive panels uh, indicate, with the coda correlation, you can use off-axis uh, tiny ice quakes in this brittle regime to uh, get uh, reasonable estimates of the, of the correlation uh, uh, constraints on the Green's function. Um, and this just shows, you know, how scattering some of these regimes are. So this is uh, uh, an eruption in the center of this Erebus array. And uh, you can see immediately this incredibly strong scattering in three components. So um, the idea here is that, you know, traditional direct waveform methodologies are, uh, they can be used, but they're very tricky. And what one has to do is em embrace the horror and use the coda, because uh, that's where most of the information is. And the correlograms actually give uh, more detailed uh, constraints on some of the internal properties of the volcano than, than the direct wave methods. Um, here's another interesting example of the sort of teleconnectivity, uh, in this case between the tectosphere and the cryosphere. These are ice quakes that are triggered in the Antarctic ice sheet. Again, these are brittle, we believe, shallow events. Uh, but in this case, they're, they're triggered at uh, sites across Antarctica by the passage of large amplitude Rayleigh waves, the Mali earthquake. And these are triggered on the, uh, the dilatational components of the uh, of the Rayleigh wave as well. We believe these are, are brittle, tensionally uh, induced uh, uh, fractures in the shallow ice sheet. Very brittle, very cold, and uh, at least that's the working hypothesis in this paper that's, uh, that's coming out soon. And I guess I, I felt I had to make a nod to the new earthquake capital of the world, uh, Oklahoma. Here's some anthropogenic earthquakes. Um, 
and you know, we record continuous data, and of course the traditional methodology is to have talented analysts that go in and analyze the big earthquakes and then laboriously go back and fill in the catalog. Um, Harley Benz and I started some work last year when I was doing sabbatical at NEIC, and we've developed a system that sits on top of the data and processing capabilities of NEIC that basically uh, facilitates um, empirical uh, calculations of templates that can be retrospectively and in near real time correlated with these continuous data. And in this case, um, you can get a magnitude of completeness catalog of down to magnitude, I think, 0.23, hardly estimated using 14 days of data with a single swarm. So you can do time varying uh, B values and other seismicity studies in near real time on these dense data sets that have thousands and thousands and thousands of events. And this will really, uh, I think, sitting on top of the talented analysts at NEIC, this will be a spectacular capability for global monitoring in all sorts of applications. And uh, Harley and the, uh, the programmers at NEIC now have this set up so uh, it can operate on any data stream that's going into NEIC. And I think it hopefully will be uh, really, really useful for uh, NEIC and all these associated sorts of studies. Um, so I, you know, I don't have time to go through all these fascinating uh, examples of these interlinked uh, uh, systems using continuous data, many of them crossing these, these traditional regimes, but these are just a few more. Um, the, the generation that tsunamis can uh, destabilize uh, ice fronts in Antarctica. Um, the uh, smooth tidal modulations of even immense features like the Ross Ice Shelf, roughly the size of Texas, by fairly small ocean tides. Um, and uh, Paul Winbury had a wonderful poster up at this meeting where uh, he's describing repeating and chaotic transitions in seismogenic uh, glacial slip patches. And some of these glacial systems are really spectacular laboratories for investigating coupled uh, uh, um, stick slip behavior and sensitivity. So, you know, if you had to look at this sort of synoptically, um, you know, uh, at least the way I was picturing it as I was thinking about this talk, the cryosphere, oceans, and tectosphere, and atmosphere, again, uh, are uh, um, rife with all sorts of fascinating gravity wave and elastic wave phenomenal and phenomena. And of course, they all couple here. And the ones in the blue, earthquakes and volcanic types of sources are sort of the, you know, the stereotypical realm of seismology, but there's this tremendously rich variety of phenomena and interactions that I've tried to illuminate with these other boxes that occupy all these other regimes. And then, of course, they're, they are connected. And then, I, again, I want to emphasize there's also the built regime and putting accelerometers in structures and applying exactly the types of methodologies that uh, that we're interested in, I think, has real value in uh, you know, the real-time evaluation, the elastic and analastic response of structures, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so there's uh, this whole interesting regime they wanted to explore in this talk of this multi-source uh, and teleconnection science that we're just beginning to, to understand and investigate thanks to the, the uh, availability of this spe these spectacular data sets. And then, of course, on top of that, Oklahoma is an example. We've got various types of uh, interesting and important anthropogenic uh, forcing uh, uh, issues. So um, another feature of these types of signals is many of them are not traditional transient types of signals that, uh, that we analyze for phase arrivals uh, and such or for dispersion in the case of surface waves. Um, they occupy the sort of continuum between highly transient phenomena and more continuous phenomena. In some cases, you can actually see one merge in and out of the other uh, regime. So some examples include the microseismic background uh, uh, noise slash signal, um, small tectonic volcanic cryospheric events that occur in swarms or in regular sequences that merge in and out of you know, what would classically be considered tremor-like behavior. Um, many of these can be, can be analyzed very uh, constructively using spectrograms, but that's just one tool. I'll show some examples here. And then there are uh, long duration events that show some internal stationarity, um, but when you get up close, you can really see that they're composed of, uh, of internal sub-events, uh, various aspects of eruptions. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about anthropogenic or forensic seismology here, but things like explosions, uh, industrial accidents, and various types of, of tremor. 
So a few comments on the global microseism. Uh, this has been recognized, of course, for a long time. In, in the uh, early days of seismology, it was an annoyance. In the early days of the WWSSN, it was actually filtered out uh, because uh, of low dynamic range systems, and it was uh, considered uninteresting. Um, but there's been a tremendous amount of work in understanding the processes that generate the microseism and the rich array of interactions between the gravity wave field in the oceans and the elastic response of the Earth that create the microseism. Here's a great paper by Arduan et al. in uh, 2011 that show how you can get on the top a storm with waves interacting with its own waves as it travels along or coastal reflections that can set up standing waves and generate the secondary microseism um, or interactions between uh, wave packets from two distinct storms. These can all generate uh, strong microseism signals. So one, one project I've been working on with my student Rob Anthony in the last couple years is to really look at the long-term history of the microseism. Uh, we're going back nominally 20 years, more at some stations. Here's an example from ALE, um, uh, way up near the Arctic Ocean. These are uh, deci-year uh, median PSDs. Um, uh, arrayed here in this sort of spectrogram-like format. It uh, starts at uh, 1990 on the left, it goes to the present day, and we analyze the intensity at this station for the primary and the secondary uh, microseism bands. And we can get these long-term histories of microseismic intensity at all these stations uh, around the world. And you can see even in the Arctic the influence of the last really strong El Nino. We might be heading into another one this year. Uh, so this will be very interesting to see. And these intensity signals, of course, are sensitive to lots and lots of uh, phenomena. One of these we've been studying in Antarctica is the changes in sea ice concentration. Um, although in parts of Antarctica where the winds have increased uh, um, offshore, the uh, uh, skirt of sea ice that seasonally surrounds Antarctica has increased. In other areas, it's dramatically decreased, including the area near the Antarctic uh, peninsula here, where there's a long standing, uh, standing GSN station, of course, uh, Palmer. Um, and so these uh, wind trends have, uh, and, and encapsulating what's called the southern annular mode, have uh, deepened the circumpolar trough. So this has strengthened the uh, uh, winds around Antarctica. And uh, this has produced, uh, contributed at least, to the warming of the Antarctic peninsula and reduce sea ice off of the peninsula. We see this very strongly in the long-term microseism trend uh, in intensity at Palmer. And so what we're starting to do is get uh, you know, uh, moving uh, window uh, estimates of uh, which stations the world's getting noisier, which stations the world's getting quieter. And uh, we've got 10 stations here now in the last 20 year reanalysis that have uh, statistically increasing microseism intensity levels. This is in the primary microseism um, at a significance of two sigma or higher. A few are decreasing. Um, Palmer is the one down, down here, uh, of course. Um, and so this is an ongoing study, and many of these have much more complex uh, changes in microseism intensity, the black dots around the globe. So, you know, what's causing this? Again, sea ice is one uh, effect that uh, uh, contributes in the, uh, in the polar regions. Uh, but there have been indications from some of the meteorological reanalyses that, uh, you know, either because of the uh, oscillation of the various uh, uh, climate modes and or because of anthropogenic warming, the uh, global wind intensity may be uh, statistically increasing. This is a, a, a meteorological reanalysis shown here at the bottom. And of course, this is uh, very interesting for a, a wide variety of reasons. And uh, certainly, you know, the microseism is a contributor. So uh, uh, we're trying to, uh, you know, see what our unique uh, kernel sensitivity for the microseism can do to contribute to these sorts of uh, reanalyses and uh, ongoing analyses of Earth's uh, wind and wave climate. And uh, we have a, a ANU association with Ian Young here, who's one of the authors on these, where we're, uh, we're the microseism team to contribute to this, along with all the other uh, remote sensing and meteorological people, to really try to put the story together. Um, so some other examples of these sort of events like the microseism, uh, processes like the microseism that have both transient and uh, um, continuous uh, um, K 
character include, of course, tectonic events. I'm not going to talk about tectonic tremor, but that, of course, was one of the, the great surprises of the last 20 years, that uh, fault zones and plate boundaries have, uh, have tremor, uh, volcanic tremors, a longstanding uh, uh, fundamental uh, signal from volcanic systems that's still not that well understood. I'll talk a little bit about that. Cryospheric systems, I'll mention a few more, and I'll also elaborate a little bit on uh, what Victor introduced with fluvial seismology. And of course, there's the whole anthropogenic issue that uh, Jeff uh, did a great job of summarizing for Oklahoma. Uh, so, um, some surprises from the uh, cryosphere. Certainly, as we put more and more instruments out in these dynamic and changing regimes, we're seeing all sorts of interesting new uh, features, um, including wholly new types of seismic sources, many coupled with the gravity wave field if they're in the, uh, associated with the oceanic system. Uh, calving seismicity at very large scales, the seminal work that uh, Iran and Meredith and others have done in describing the uh, Greenland uh, calving-based uh, uh, enormous uh, glacial events. Uh, we're seeing these now in uh, Antarctica and Alaska at new levels of fidelity. Uh, tightly coupled and other quasi-repeating uh, systems that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Teleseismic triggered ice quakes that I mentioned. Iceberg seismicity and tremor. I'll show a few examples of that. And uh, some uh, signals that you record on floating seismographs, and we're entering an exciting new era where we're getting more broadband seismographs put out on large tabular ice bodies. I'll show a little bit about that. So here's kind of a canonical example of what happens when you go to a place like Antarctica that has not just uh, uh, tectospheric, but also volcanic, oceanic, and uh, uh, cryospheric events. Well, of course, we see teleseismic surface waves. These are explosions from the volcano, like the one I showed in the Scatter movie. These are actually the tiny ice quakes I was alluding to that occur in the summit glaciers and are, are highly seasonal. Um, and there's two examples here of a high amplitude and a low amplitude tremor. Um, these are not uh, volcanic tremors I'll show in a moment. Um, and of course, we have the pervasive micro from the Southern Ocean. So um, in this case, the tremor is not volcanic. It's coming from icebergs. Um, here's, a, here's a spectrogram sped up 100 times. It has a very interesting character. Let's see if we can get some volume here. It's a bit trombone-like. So it'll come back here. There it goes. And then you'll see it, it takes on a very different character here as the, uh, as the harmonics, as the harmonic structure dissipates. So this interested not just you know, those of us who had a, a network on Mount Erebus and the McMurdo Sound area, but also the glaciologists, uh, Doug McHale and Emil O'Call and myself and many others got together to look at this in a great deal of detail ultimately because there was a giant iceberg park just off of McMurdo during this period. So we instrumented this iceberg C-16 and recorded these, uh, these rather spectacular seismograms here. Um, and uh, when you look at these closely, I'll show you they have a very, very remarkable character. They have such a remarkable character that Doug McHale uh, called me up on the phone, panicked, and said the seismograph is broken. This can't be right. Um, so these are actually reversing events from um, the uh, uh, icebergs uh, interacting in a, on a stick-slip basis as they're uh, perturbed by the tides in the Ross Sea. And if you blow up this little eye here. You see it's got a, first of all, it's got a, this interesting sort of anti-symmetric character here um, as it goes across. Uh, if you blow this up, you see that uh, it's, it consists of a sequence of tens of thousands of impulses with repeat periods of around a second. Then it goes through a, through a hiatus here. And then it picks up maybe with some interesting starting phase here and repeats, but the polarity uh, reverses. Um, and the harmonic structure is entirely due to the fact that uh, we're, we're uh, observing sort of a Dirac comb effect here, where, of course, the Fourier transform of a sequence of impulses is a, is a, a line spectrum or a sequence of impulses in the frequency domain. So if these things are regularly spaced, we get harmonic behavior. This is exactly what happens to make uh, 
um, squeaky hinges and other uh, phenomena for moving stick slip systems. Um, and so we were able to occupy this iceberg C16 here as uh, this other iceberg B15 was sawing against it in a very narrow contact zone. And we were able to, uh, in this JGR article and some subsequent studies, really take a close look at these reversing, repeating uh, ice quakes. And uh, we're basically able to, with the help of GPS uh, on board the moving iceberg, get a really, really great constraint on the, uh, the driving of the system. So that's a relatively simple one. This is ice on ice. Both icebergs are floating, uh, and uh, C-16 is grounded, but B-15 was sawing back and forth with the tides. Um, here's a more complicated example. This was a, a, a seismograph that was atop the uh, B-15 iceberg as it uh, traveled finally out of the McMurdo Sound area and broke up into fragments on the, at the tip of uh, Victoria Land. And um, it uh, shattered off of Cape Adair there uh, due to what we now know was an impact with a, uh, with a structure at the, at the floor of the ocean. So now we're looking at seismic signals that are related to the breakup of an iceberg from a, from a station on the iceberg. Um, and also related to the much more complicated stick-slip processes of the iceberg running aground. So it's uh, ice contacting the seafloor. And uh, if we take a close look at this, uh, this is a one-day segment here that shows the breakup of this iceberg, which is many tens of kilometers long. Fortunately, the, the seismograph did not fall into the ocean and was recovered later. Um, there was a very hard hit against this uh, submarine shoal. We believe it's probably a volcanic ridge that's just at the right uh, depth to sort of score the bottom of the iceberg. And uh, that has a very interesting character. And you hear it's much more com uh, complex harmonically. That's the iceberg scraping against the bottom of, uh, against the seafloor. And here's where it actually broke up during a subsequent uh, collision. And you can actually hear the, the fractures as the, as the iceberg comes apart. So those are those broadband transients. There's a little bit of iceberg harmonic tremor as some of the floating fragments are um, interacting. <laughs> so that's those are the pieces uh, back in uh, free floating. Uh, format rubbing against each other. So we did a pretty interesting analysis of this breakup in a, in a paper we published with Celie Martin and others. Uh, just a few comments on some of these volcanic sources. Um, as you know, I think most people know, volcanic systems are, are very important uh, uh, to understanding for societal purposes and are also are woefully under-instrumented. Uh, we had this wonderful workshop here in Anchorage recently to try to re-energize the uh, um, volcano community to think bigger, and I think we're making some progress there. Uh, there's obviously this uh, spectacular experiment that's coming up on Mount St. Helens that I think will be a, hopefully a landmark data set for this sort of work. Um, here's a classic example from Mount St. Helens where, again, you can see this uh, merging between the transient and the continuous regimes, where you have these drumbeat events that turn into tremor. 
And here's a really interesting example uh, of, a, of a direct comb type system recorded with tremor at readout volcano. And here you can see the uh, a frequency, uh, uh, fundamental frequency of the tremor going up to uh, many tens of hertz. And this is interesting because uh, you can't really do this with any kind of a classically resonant structure. This has to be some sort of repeating direct comb type of, uh, of phenomenon, at least with this type of tremor. So it uh, really uh, illuminates there might be uh, some stick slip or other mechanism that's actually generating this, this tremor. Here's a wonderful example of uh, recent work from Matt Haney. Again, it's been pointed out that you don't always need large ends. Sometimes you just need a few instruments in the right place. Here he was able to actually uh, back project Rayleigh waves from long period tremor to get uh, 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 time varying uh, uh, distribution. Um, and just a few comments here about ocean waves. Uh, ocean waves are inherently dispersive here. The longer wavelength ones travel faster than the shorter wavelength ones. There's a very simple dispersion relationship for deep water waves here um, in that uh, you can get the distance here in this equation at the bottom by simply taking the slope of the trend of energy in a spectrogram. And so uh, this is what you get when you put a broadband seismograph on a large tabular floating uh, ice body in the southern ocean. And every one of these swaths is the swell packet from a distant oceanic swarm. Some of them, like this one, have come from as far away as Alaska. These things are just like seismic surface waves in a sense, although they're gravity waves in the ocean. They uh, travel with speeds of a, a bicyclist to a car, basically, all the way across the ocean. Um, and these were recorded in, in this seminal deployment, uh, nascent iceberg at the tip of the Ross ice shelf. So uh, all these swaths are different uh, um, storms around the world. Of course, the buoy people have realized this for a long time. Walter Monk did seminal experiments with this way back in the, in the 60s, looking at packets crossing the ocean. But now we can actually instrument the southern oceans uh, by putting broadband seismographs on floating ice bodies where you can't put buoys because of the presence of, of icebergs and ice. So the difference between a floating seismometer signal uh, and a uh, Land-based seismometer signal is, uh, is interesting. They're highly complementary. Here's a primary microseism and secondary microseism on a floating seismometer at nascent. And here are the same signals on a relatively nearby rock-sided uh, seismograph in Antarctica on Scott Base. Uh, you can see, uh, of course, all the earthquakes here. Uh, we also found that we can see many tsunamis from calving events all over the Southern Ocean. So these are not coming from Storms, these little linearly dispersed signals are actually coming from calving events. We can get their uh, radius even with a single seismograph using the very simple propagation of a swell in the ocean. Um, but these are events from all over the Ross Sea area that are recorded uh, by the dynamic uh, displacement of the iceberg. Um, and finally, uh, I, I, I'm glad to announce that this is being taken to a new level with an experiment that uh, myself and many colleagues are doing starting this year. We're going to put an array of over 20 broadband seismographs across the Ross Ice Shelf starting this year. So there's two lines here, one from Ross Island all the way over to West Antarctica and another uh, one that goes uh, interior into the, uh, into the Ross Ice Shelf. So we'll get this spectacular long period array to study the interaction of uh, of gravity waves uh, with the ice shelf, also to do solid earth seismology, recording surface waves and some body waves through the water column. Here's a close up. We're uh, hoping, although it's, uh, it's still in NSF's hands, I think we'll all probably get support to put this short period array here at the center. Um, and uh, these are all sorts of new types of phenomena between the cryosphere, solid earth, and an ocean system that we're hoping to observe and understand better and also use to measure the strength of the ice shelf, um, including the possibility of recording flexural waves, which have this anomalous sort of dispersion here. Here's an example from sea ice uh, of a flexural wave. Um, and finally, just a quick comment on fluvial seismology. Victor did a nice job of announcing this. I'll, I'll just mention that I think this is a rapidly developing and very interesting field. There have been a few measurements in Antarctica of, of end glacial or subglacial flow, like this paper here by, by Paul and others. 
Um, if we had arrays uh, of, uh, of arrays out there, we could actually track all these transients and understand where and how the fluids are moving through the glacier. Um, and here we have uh, seismic and infrasound uh, uh, data from the Grand Canyon controlled flood by, by Brandon, myself, and others. Here's that low frequency peak we were talking about before that doesn't show up in Victor's model. And uh, here's another peak that couples both into seismic and infrasound. And here's the peak that's very interesting to geomorphologists because it's dictated by the remobilization of, uh, of uh, um, bed load within the canyon. So I'll just stop here and say that, you know, we're just recording tremendous amounts of unusual continuous uh, signals in these experiments, uh, many of which were uh, nominally put out for other purposes, of course, but I think we need to be open to looking at all these interesting signals that interact uh, between the various spheres. Um, and uh, I'll just say that, you know, uh, deploying at near source distances shouldn't be ruled out. We need to have methodologies to get uh, continuous data close to sources, because often with these continuous sources, the only way to really discriminate them well is to remove the path effects as much as possible. So small numbers of close-in stations are still very, very important to this business. So thank you very much.